Okay, um, I don't know if I'm going to talk about clocks, aging, zinc, and speakers, but there are a few terms that kind of popped into my head as I was trying to work out what I was going to talk about. Um, I used to make installations, um, and in those installations, I suppose there was some listening happening. Um, so this was a work where we used seismic sensors to pick up the sound of people basically jumping. It was at a music festival, you know, whatever, 30, 40,000 people or something. So they were picking up this kind of infrasound and then pitch shifting it and playing it out through lampshades and stuff like that. So there was listening happening in that. Um, but kind of thinking about a lot of the stuff that was discussed in the last workshop, um, I think there's a lot of concern around what it is to listen. And I started thinking about what it is to be listened to. Um, the experience of I am speaking but you are listening to me or I'm in a conversation and as I'm listening I'm aware and I'm constantly judging am I being understood and I'm kind of responding to that um, so that's where I'm kind of going to end up in a couple of minutes with kind of my question around what that might be and to get there I'm going to look at some really old work um, so this was a kind of a, an accidental listening device. It kind of draws on a lot of the stuff in Chris and Alice's kind of approach to the cello. So in this work, I actually wasn't thinking about listening. I was thinking about kind of the idea of autopoiesis and a, a system that tries to balance um, two activities and can be perturbed, but, but returns to balance in some kind of state. So, so what I had in this kind of piece was two uh, sheets of zinc. So here's the zinc coming in, and speakers. Um, and the way the system worked, kind of, kind of talked through it a bit, was the two, the two plates of zinc are sitting in a solution of zinc oxide, and there's an electric voltage applied across them. So one plate is getting eroded. Actually, in this case, this one's getting dissolved, and this one's getting plated. So the zinc is being transferred across. And as that happens, because they're on a balance, the heavy one starts descending into the water and the other one starts rising. Um, and after about 36 hours, there was a tilt sensor on it. So once one of them hit the bottom, the voltage was switched and it started moving the zinc back again. And that would take, I think it was in around a day and a half for this kind of oscillation to take place. So a really slow oscillation. And I may return to this idea of time scales that Martin picked up on. Added into that were these solenoids then with which I could kind of just tap the plates or I could hold it against the plate and inject sound. And the sound I'd inject would be recordings taken from the plate using the um, piezo contact mics that might have been taken a few minutes earlier. Um, and then there were also, I just used some kind of sine waves in the, so in the software that would kind of push sound into it. So I might record off the left plate and then feed that sound into the right plate or vice versa. And you see slots in the wall, there were speakers there just amplifying this all massively. The sound of electroplating is kind of like the sound of chips frying. Uh, they kind of like make this kind of chips frying sound. When you drop the first <laughs> chip in, that, that kind of like plinky, plinky. So that was, but you have to, in my software, there's just like a multiply by 100,000 kind of game to kind of bring all this up. And then, of course, because of the speakers, it's all um, really open to kind of feedback. The idea was we were interested in these, these kind of tree-like um, growths of zinc something or other. Zinc oxide, zinc, there's no sulfurs in there. It must be some kind of zinc oxide solution. The current is too high to get clean electroplating. So you get this kind of grey muck growing on one as the other one kind of dissolves. Um, so, but they grow out into kind of nice tree-like structures. I didn't have a good picture of that. And so the idea is the system's trying to grow these, but then also the sound being fed into it perturbs it, and kind of how do I, how do I kind of balance that? So I kind of built the system and then spent um, a few nights in the gallery making the software to kind of join all of that together. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about ever going back to this software. I opened it up for the first time. It still works, kind of. Uh, I don't have the system anymore. But the software still records sound and pumps things in. And then... Because of this really high gain, there was this notch feed here. I had um, a travelling filter to cut out the uh, feedback. So the, the piece would kind of often get locked into um, just uh, screaming feedback. But then what would happen is a filter would pick up 
fiddle object, pitch detection rather than amplitude, pick up the frequency, zoom in and cut that frequency and then boost the gain even higher and you get a different mode coming out. So that's happening there as well and kind of playing with how quickly that filter tries to cut out that sound. And it all made nice music of some sort, sound, um, people liked it. Um, but what was interesting was I, I was kind of in bed and I got this phone call. It was displayed in a gallery in Dublin, the Lab Gallery, which is a 24-hour security presence because where it is in Dublin, so even though it's closed, there's a security guard sitting downstairs just looking out the window at the um, entertainment on the street. And um, I got a call from the uh, security guard who'd been passed on my number because the piece was just left running all the time. I didn't leave a method for it to turn down. It took 36 hours. And he, I could hear it in the background. It was going ballistic. And he was getting a little tired. It was, you know, this had been going through. And it, it had got itself locked into some mode that I didn't kind of know about. So I said, well, I'm very sorry about that. And I'm in a different part of Dublin, and he's there. And the box, the plinth is all screwed up. There's no way to, the, the power is in behind the wall that we plastered. It's kind of like, whoops. So I, I kind of said to him, I said, shout at it. Um, and he kind of went, oh. And I said, just, just try it. And so he went up and he shouted at it and it worked. It, um, it pushed it over because I realised what was happening was that the plates um, with the piezo pickup made it basically a, an accidental listening device. I'd been thinking of this as this <coughs> completely enclosed system. I guess I was thinking the tank maybe be surrounded or something and that the plates are listening to themselves and, and so it's all in there. But of course it was picking up sound from the space. So luckily I kind of thought, well, if you go and shout at it, maybe that would be enough, and, and it was. So that was fine. And I never changed the software. Um, I stuck a limiter in, actually, down here, PD limit. I think I'd probably put it to take a bit of the edge off it. But generally, night, at night time, for some reason, all the time, I'd arrive the next day, the security guard would be leaving, or I'd message and say, yeah, it, it did that again, but I, you know, I just shouted at it, and that, that fixed it. Um, and I want some way to segue from that into the experience of being listened to. And I suppose if I think the security guard did not have an experience of being listened to, he had an experience of being heard. He was commanding the, the installation to cut it out, move on, do something else. I don't know actually what he said. I just said, shout at it. Um, <laughs> oh, you would just stop your wrecking me hurt! Or something like that is probably what he said. Um, so this idea is more less listened to a more kind of voice control, which then got me thinking about um, voice control as you know as this kind of thing we know. So the only time I use Siri on my phone is when I'm cooking an egg. It's actually great. You go, well, I go set timer to seven minutes, okay? And I noticed myself doing this in conversation. And Paul said, yeah, it's like tea, Earl Grey, hot which is the Star Trek reference. So in 1987, somebody in Hollywood thought that in the year 2364 on a spaceship, the way to make tea will be to instruct a device, tea, Earl Grey, hot. I go into the kitchen, I go, I'd like a cup of tea. I don't go, I'd like of the genus tea, of the type, Earl Grey, of the, you know, this kind of, this breaking down. So that, that kind of was going on. But inherent in that is there's a kind of an assumption about the listener's capabilities that we make. Okay, so we kind of assume that the machine will understand me if I speak to it, set timer seven minutes or for seven minutes. I could actually say, would you mind setting the timer, please, for seven minutes? So there's an assumption about how the machine's going to work. And when I begin a conversation, I work off these assumptions. This tied in with my kind of idea of aging, that, that horrible experience of seeing somebody who doesn't know your grandmother very well, talking to her as if she's senile and deaf when she is neither of those things. This kind of, the assumption we bring to the beginning of a conversation, so that's the first part. But then, in conversation, we have this continuous kind of changing based on our perception of the listener's understanding, this kind of feedback, of course, which makes up conversation. And I'm not, so yesterday I discovered Pask's conversation theory. I'm late and ignorant to the field, but, <laughs> but this, um, network has brought me to it and kind of find that very interesting. So two ideas, I guess, assumptions and then this notion of kind of feedback and in me, in my head, what's going on is like, what is it to be listened to? And then I kind of think about making these systems and I kind of remember this really nice um, description from David Rockaby when he was talking about one of the early um, versions of Very Nervous System from 1983, I think he said. And so if you know Very Nervous System, it's, it's a system that just had a very simple digital camera and you moved in front of it and it generated music, sound, based on your movement. Um, 
he described in, I think it was in 1983 or 81, he, had, he was asked to exhibit this work, this new piece of work he was working on. And he spent days locked away from friends or any other human contact writing this software um, and pulling it together. And then when he installed it in the gallery, it didn't work. And he couldn't work out why it didn't work until he saw a video of him moving in front of the work. And he kind of described, I don't know my notes here, but he talked about, he was, he was kind of, he was amused, but also kind of um, disconcerted to see that he was moving in these very jarred kind of movements. And what had happened is his whole way of moving had changed because as he developed the system, he was, he was kind of moving in a way he knew the system would respond to. He thought he was still moving uh, in his natural dance kind of style. Um, I think it's a bit out of the quote. It's like, uh, rather than developing an interface that understood movement, I'd evolved with the interface and developing a way of moving that the interface understood as I developed the interface itself. So to me, I love that, that kind of, that we can be, as creators of systems, we can get caught up in the system and end up designing it in such a way that it encourages behavior or movement or acting or something that's quizzical or different or certainly unintended. And that's for us as the creator, whatever about somebody coming to this system. Well, in, in Rockaby's case, the, the user coming to the system, it just didn't work. They couldn't get it to do anything. And he got around that with something else. Okay, so there are my thoughts following on from the first installment of the humanizing algorithmic listening thing. But I guess what I want to return to is um, where to put the experience of being listened to in an inquiry of humanizing algorithmic listening. And I also had a note saying there must be a term for the, what, the experience of being listened to. Rather than speaking or hearing or listening, these, these terms, what is the experience of being listened to? <laughs> I don't know. Letters, uh, uh, postcard, email afterwards. Thanks very much. Okay.